All right, everybody, we're back with another, this time not interview. Everything else has been interview style. We have one presentation uh, that one of our guests here is presenting to you guys today. It's really on the idea of what is smart money. This is Nick Cohen, uh, or Nick Cowan, I believe. I, I think I mispronounced that. Uh, okay. President of the, <laughs> pres down. yeah, everybody welcome. Here, here he is. How do I pronounce it? Yeah, just think of the animal, cow and Cow Ann. Uh, Nick, so, Nick, Nick, Nick Cowan. <laughs> Nick, introduce yourself. Uh, what have you been up to in the crypto space? And give us some, some, some context about your presentation before you uh, sh uh, do a screen share here. Yeah, sure. So just a bit of background, guys. My, I was um, in um, uh, traditional investment banking and I was a trader. I was, I was a trader uh, in London and in Japan trading um, derivatives and different instruments and cash. And, um, and what you pick up over the, uh, the three and a half decades I've been doing it is... Um, you can apply some simple disciplines to try to help, let's just call them amateur traders. And most people are amateur traders because they normally have a day job. Um, and amateur traders, um, people like me, historically professional traders, we need, a, we need an endless, an endless uh, factory assembly line of amateur traders because the more amateur traders that come to the market, the, uh, the better it is for people, people like me. So, what I want trends to try to are built on dead bodies. Is, is it's a it's exactly heard. right, and um, you know, it's um, you know, it's it's the great thing about um, about markets and trading is, I have so many people come to me, my friends, and look by nature they're successful, they're smart, they're doctors, they're lawyers, and they've saved up twenty, thirty grand, and they say, listen, I'm thinking about um, starting trading in the evenings because I want to double my money. What, what what's your advice? And I just say, don't be a schmuck. Because I need people, because the human ego is, I'm a doctor, I'm really clever, I must be able to do what you do because you're really stupid. And actually, what, what you need to be able to do is to really try to protect people to um, manage their equity better. So the, um, the, so the, the journey for me was, um, I was running a really big business, I was Globe Head of Trading, became the Globe Head of Equities for one of the biggest investment banks, and um, we were in about 40 countries. Um, and we were, we were um, then I left the industry to manage my own money. So I went back to being a professional trader, which, uh, which was a bit of a wake up call. because I thought I was much better than I really was when I was suddenly at home in my study with two screens. Um, GSX then came along, the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. I was asked to, to help set that up seven, seven years ago. Um, and we made a decision a couple of years ago that we would basically go all in on digital, digital securities. We see that as the big paradigm shift. Um, we've been effectively in a T plus two model or a T plus three model forever. And, um, and just in terms of traditional securities, you know, we see that the, the cost cycle is too high. There's too much capital being posted. There's big counterparty risk since Lehman's went bust 12 years ago, nothing's changed. Um, you can't really interoperate between countries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a bunch of things that we believe blockchain technology and digital securities can fix. Um, and so for the last couple of years, we've been investing heavily in terms of that. We've been building our own blockchain for, for securities that's fit for purpose. Um, the, the great thing about the crypto industry, it's brought buckets of innovation and huge, huge change to, uh, to the way um, value can be transferred. What it, what it lacks sometimes is compliance with the regulatory world when it comes to securities because they're ba mainly bearer assets and of course securities are registered. So what we've tried to do is say, okay, let's take the really cool stuff from that universe. Let's take everything we know about the, the traditional regulated world. Let's combine that into a GSX end-to-end -end smart security strategy where we effectively move to a T-instant model. And we believe that's going to change the universe. So that's, that's in process of being rolled out this year. And we're super excited. And real quick, so when you say T1 or T3 or T instant, that means the time of settlement between parties. Is that right? One Precisely. day, three days. And now what you're saying is in, in the traditional worlds, you're, you're, you know, old business, you know, you've been trading 35 years. When you want to settle up between people and say, you owe me this, you owe me that, it's three days to settle that transaction or one day. And now we can do it instantly. Exactly. So when you think about BTC, if I, let's just say I'm, I'm not trading on margin. If, if, you're, if you're on an exchange and I'm on an exchange and I've got five BTC and you've got a bunch of um, Tether or Fiat or whatever in your wallet, if I sell this BTC to you, at that point, you've, you're basically now the owner of my BTC. And we've basically done that, well, in an in a exchange, it's happened actually instantaneously, but then you've got the wallet wallet transfer, which takes it a little bit, a little bit longer. Um, but the point is, it's down to seconds rather than days. Um, and that, that starts to release huge efficiency. 
If you try to do that in securities, what you have is you have a, a vertical stack of existing, what we call financial market infrastructure players. So I call my broker because I can't join an exchange directly like I, like I can with Bitcoin. You call your broker. I want to sell my Apple shares and you decided you want to buy Apple shares. Our brokers go to an exchange, NASDAQ or the NYC or wherever. The buy order and the sell order goes in. And then basically you have a exchange reports to a central counterparty. The central counterparty then novates those trades. The central securities depository then two days later then ensures that the securities and the fiat and the banking system, just all this noise and mess. And, and uh, two days later, I get your money and you get my Apple shares. And that's, and our view is, look, to be honest, I should be able to sell my digital Apple shares to you instantaneously, just like we can effectively trade things like Bitcoin. And if we can do that, we release all of that uh, friction, we release all of that cost, we release that counterparty risk, we re release the capital that's constantly being posted by brokers. Every time a big institution gives an order to a broker, they have to put capital up to make sure the T plus two world continues to, to evolve. So there's a huge amount of stuff where technology is now breaking through to allow us to uh, to be able to not and not just move to T instant, but also um, ensure that you can have multiple exchanges working off a single network. And that's where it becomes really cool, particularly for investors. I think there's no question whether it's from the crypto side or the traditional investment side that digital securities and their exchanges is the way of the future. Yeah. When you guys are able to launch, is there any particular market segment that you're targeting, such as digitized stocks or fractionalized real estate, or is it going to be all encompassing? So we see four different asset classes to begin with. Um, and then I'll talk about scale. So asset classes we see is number one, issuers issuing brand new tokens that are brand new securities in either equity debt or fund form. So brand new ones, we call them natives. The second market is what we call tokenized depository receipts. Think about ADRs. Tokenized depository receipts is where you take a lump of IBM, a lump of Apple, a lump of Renault, you stick it into a depository, and then you immediately tokenize and put that into a digital form backed by underlying classic shares. And then you can have your brokers. It still looks like IBM. It's just settling instantly. Then you've got bankable assets. Like you say, you've got real estate, you've got commodities, you've got art, you've got a bunch of stuff there as well, which can be tokenized and have fractional ownership. And that's really now starting to back up as an exciting, exciting pipeline. We're engaged with a bunch of real estate guys um, who want to come through our grid, our tokenization venue, and ultimately come on, onto our exchange. We think that's just going to be a huge pipeline. And then fourthly, currency, because we've got to be able to tokenize. Today, we have to tokenize fiat. And we have to create what we call a TCR, a tokenized currency receipt, because as of today, no central bank has yet issued a, a digital currency. But I see that in the next three years, that's, that's just a given. I see probably the ECB, um, or maybe even the Fed, or whoever, MAS in Singapore, somebody's going to issue a, a digital currency for their economy, because it just makes so much sense. So um, in terms of target market, we're likely to see, in terms of the first layer, the natives, that's probably going to be the smaller type of corporate looking for five, 10 million bucks. Um, will Facebook call me and say we want to tokenize our company? Probably not, not, not anytime soon. But there's the smaller companies who are just desperate for capital. And banks aren't really lending for a while now. The cost of capital coming to a traditional market is anything between 6 and 12%. It's just too high. So we should be able to help smaller companies get access to capital and, and basically get to work to buy that factory down the road. So, um, but we see probably parallel universe for five, 10 years. You'll see the T plus two. And um, it's a bit like vinyl versus CD versus streaming versus now nobody ever pays for music. You'll just see this whole, I mean, I've got three daughters and they've never, they don't even know what it means to buy music. It's free, right? So why would you pay? You're an idiot. So we've just got this whole, shift this dynamic shift the where we see over the next five years a convergence and then it'll just be the new normal and so by by giving these you know smaller companies you say access to capital could you break down where that new capital is coming from and why it's been created with with the global stock or with the gibraltar stock exchange i just think we want to try to think of securities as securities um i think the reason why capital has become so expensive is because of the, um, in many ways, the friction that currently exists. Um, you know, there, it's very rare that somebody will say to me, you know, our margins are exploding and our regulatory costs are collapsing. It's always the other way around. And that whole cost of having those layers just has meant that the cost of capital goes up. I don't necessarily see um, new money coming in, but what I do see, which I think is also really cool, 
is at the moment, if you go to NASDAQ or the London Stock Exchange or the Singapore Exchange, et cetera, issuers tend to be governed by the geography of the exchange. And actually they're restricted by the clients of that exchange. And actually what you should be able to do, which is what we're building at the moment, we're, we're in application for an exchange in Asia, we're in application for an exchange in Europe. We also are obviously here in Gibraltar. We'll then be looking at North America in 2021. You wanna be able to have uh, securities in the same issuer trading globally 24 five. So if, um, if an issuer in the UK is trading in our Asian exchange, you're opening up a whole new liquidity pool of, uh, of new investors who might be really interested in some cool stuff coming out of a different time zone, a different geography. So it's that pan-jurisdictional interoperability, which our blockchain enables you to do, is also, I think, going to be a really exciting development. Fascinating. All right. Well, that was a very amazing overview of all the things you're doing at Gibraltar Stock Exchange. Uh, really excited about all that. And now, just as excited uh, to dive into the What is Smart Money presentation. So one of the things you don't see too often is... Um, is really a, an insight into trying to read uh, markets and, and trying to read and understand what the smart money is doing. I'm going to get into what the smart money is and who are they and, and what they do and some of those concepts. But what I want to try to do is the purpose of the, this next 15, 20 minutes is purely to try to give you some insights into some of the things that I've picked up along the last three and a half decades. To caveat, I'm not a financial um, advisor. I don't, I'm not a trading coach. I don't sell software. I run an exchange. So this is nothing other than an insight into, into some of the lessons that I've learned. And if they can help you be a better trader and a better risk manager, then, uh, then that was probably a good 15, 20 minutes of, uh, of my time. And I hope I, I, hope I, um, I, hope I help. Um, so my background, as you just heard, I was, um, I've been a trader most of, my, most of my career and I ended up running a, an equities business. Um, with sales trading research globally in about 40 countries or so. So it was a big business. And if there's been a crash in the last 30 years, I've traded it, starting off with the 87 crash, Black Monday, all the way through. So um, there's, um, there's some scar, I've got the scars to, uh, to show it. So let's have a look at how the smart money operates. If you think of the smart money as basically the big institutions who have enormous amounts of capital and to deploy that capital, they need to be able to, um, be able to establish or get rid of a position contrary to what the rest of the market is doing. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. So if we think about um, the way markets work, and so this won't take long, but basically what you have is basically you have something called accumulation. You then tend to have the mark up, you have distribution, and then you have the mark down. And so it goes on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through some of those cycles in a moment. There's a couple of great quotes. I think Mark Twain, if you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. And if you do read it, you're misinformed. And I think what, what I'm going to show you in a minute is you don't really need to watch CNBC in the background while you're studying. Uh, what you should do is I always do. I always say trade on what you see, not what you hear. Um, you're, you've got to understand that when it comes to trading, there are probably unlimited amount of systems and strategies and styles and everything else. I'm just going to show you one which has worked for me for a long time. But the main thing is you need to be able to believe in your system and, and shut out a lot of the noise. And as Warren Buffett said, and if there's anybody who's smarter than him, I've yet to meet them. Most people get interested in stocks when everyone else is. The time to get interested is when no one else is. You can't buy what's popular and do well. And I think that's a really big lesson. And we're going to see that in a moment. What he means by that. I'm going to touch on risk management. Um, people confuse risk management is the management of losses and money management is the management of profits. What I can tell you is most amateur traders, they run their losses because they uh, think they were right and they take their profits too early. And what I'm going to try to show you today is how to reverse that cycle. So actually you understand that the management of losses, a great trader know how, knows how to lose money. And I know that might sound like an odd statement, but if you are, if you're a really good trader, you understand this is an unemotional strategy you know how to lose money, and it's just a cost of doing business. I'm going to show you what that means in a moment. Um, in terms of the, um, a couple of rules, which I'll touch on, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. Um, let's say you've got $10,000. Um, never have one, more than 1% of your equity at risk in any single position, meaning you cannot and should not lose more than $100 in a trade. I will tell you what that means in a moment. But what that means, when I see people who say, yeah, I'm down three grand from a 10 grand portfolio, I just put my head in my hands and just go, how could, how could that even happen? Well, there was a stock and I really liked it and then I bought more when it fell. And then I bought, you just, come on guys, you, you've got to be more disciplined. So try to understand, never 
always limit the risk that you can lose in any one position. Never have more than 6% of your entire equity at risk at any one time. If you're down more than 10% in a month, I can promise you you're doing something wrong. So just stop, walk away, take time out, and figure out what you're, what you're doing wrong. And if a position hasn't uh, started to work within, I have a 30-day rule, just, um, just get rid of it and move on. Everything has to be objective, unemotional, et cetera. And then we'll get into the, uh, the smart money. Um, think about when you look at a chart, which I'm about to show you, just think of it as, um, I always think of it, it's um, like um, the, uh, just a in constant battle between buyers and sellers. And all you're seeing is all the time this battlefield. And I'll show you some of the volatility in a moment. And then you get the signs to see who actually is winning. And when that win, when one side wins, the market will either go up, as we saw a mark up or a mark down. Think about fear and greed. Most of those are emotions. And uh, we need those emotions to be able to capitalize if you can know how to read it. And the smart money knows those emotions. And I will show you in a moment how they, how they work. But basically, if you look historically, I can almost point to most charts and you will generally see that if there has been an event, it's generally if there's been extremely good news and the stock has flown, the smart money will be selling. And you might think that's completely opposite. I'll explain to you um, why it's so vital that you understand that. I'm gonna walk you through a, a generic chart and then we're gonna take a look at BTC because I'm gonna try and show you how to apply some of these disciplines to, uh, to an asset which I know many of you are, are keen, to, uh, keen to focus on. But just remember, the smart money tends to do the opposite of what you're thinking. Why? Remember what Warren Buffett said, you buy on bad news, you sell on good. It's always contrary. So we're gonna look at supply and demand. We're gonna, I'm gonna, don't worry about this too much, we'll get into it. I'm gonna show you what cause and effect means and I'm gonna show you what effort versus result means. Here's a chart. This could be Apple, it could be Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. You'll have charts that look like this on nearly every chart. And what I'm gonna ask you is, can we work out looking at that chart if there were any smart trades that we should have taken? Is there smart money at work? And do we, can we have an idea of where this is going next? And um, you can use so many different tools. You've got so many, uh, if you go onto any charting software, you'll probably have 200 drop down stats. Um, in terms of um, stochastics, MACD, Z-score, force index, uh, just everything, loads of different moving average calculators. And um, some of those may work for you. I don't bother with any of them. What I do is I just get a ruler out and, and I do that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through what this means. The first thing you need to understand is when you look at a chart, and let's just say this is Bitcoin, we'll see that in a moment, there are, there are three things that jump out at me straight away, and this is volume. So this is the daily, vo daily volume, we're looking at July, August, September, in a year, somewhere, and here's the price of the stock. And we don't really care what the stock is, it's just a chart. Look at these big volumes. So this will start to get me interested. So what we're gonna do is take a hypothetical, um, look at this chart, and we're looking at it here. I'm not really interested, but I'm watching a stock go up. And when it gets to here, this volume will get my attention because this is something called climactic action. And you see this in Bitcoin a lot. You see climactic action happening. And what you're seeing is volume has exploded. The stock has reached a high and then it started to tail off. Okay, I'm now really, really interested because what you're looking for is you're looking for something called climactic action followed by a test. And what does this mean? The herd, think of the herd as the... Uh, 99,000 retail and one smart money investor. The herd is so passionate because almost definitely there would have been good news here. So JP Morgan's results, incredible. And the stock has basically been pushed here, rallied up to here. Now, in case you don't know what this means, this bar, this is a high, this is a low, this is the open, this little nodule here is the close. If a, if a close is somewhere down the bottom of the bar, you could, it's fair to say it probably hasn't had a very good day. This is really important. So this climactic action, this momentum, it takes a while for an oil tanker to turn. But look what happens down here. This to me is telling me straight away, okay, the smart money has left the building. They have sold their stock. Why do I know they've sold? Because we can see activity. The volume is huge. Every buyer needs a seller and every seller needs a buyer. So when the volume spikes like this, you know the big money's coming in. They have positions so big, they have to sell when everybody else is buying. So again, what I'm looking for here is, it, you'll often see it come back down and then rally. 
when it comes back down, this is the first level of support. This is where the herd is going, no, 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 no. Apple is going to the roof. I'm using Apple or JP Morgan or whatever. And, uh, and they carry on pushing it. Now I'm getting ready to trade. And I'll show you this trade in a moment. But look at this. Point C, the stock has come up. It's met the point A. It's reached a new high. And then it's closed, excuse my French, on its ass. This to me is like a home run. It's a slam dunk. I am now looking to short this position. And I'll show you how I do that in a moment. This would be a very, very favorable trade for, for someone like me, where I think, okay, climactic action, followed by a fail test. The bears have beaten the bulls. This battle here, these guys are winning. The volume's gone. The smart money's out. Let's see what happens next. And then look what happens. If you want to know what the definition of a trend is, a downward trend is lower highs. See this high, high. It's lower. This, this high of the bar is lower than the last one. Lower, lower, lower. Look at the lows. Every low, this is a downward trend. This is a stock in trouble. So this stock is going to carry on falling until guess what? The volume. Now I'm, now I'm interested again. I'm thinking, okay, the smart money is going back in because guess what? The volume has spiked. It's reached support. It's probably going to bounce. You can call it a dead cat bounce. It's going to probably come back and test. It's the reverse of here. Climactic action followed by a test. Climactic action. This is now the area to get ready to buy. And what you're going to see here is just like we talked about this, I call this the ice line. This will become increasingly important later on as we see. This is the first line of support. And here, you've seen this first line of resistance. Guess what? The herd are now all getting stopped out. They're all panicking. They're going to have to sell their position. So it's going to carry on going. The smart money's done their work here. They bought. They're now going to start to get ready to push this back up. And you see, again, you see this here. It's starting to bounce here and it's getting ready. They're testing it and they're getting ready to give it a push. And what will happen is, you're getting increasingly uh, accumulation now going on, and they're probably going to repeat this cycle here. And you see this time and time again, 34, 44. Think about that range. You've basically got 10 bucks at play here. It's 25, 30%, depending on which way you're looking at it. So if you can learn how to start to look at any chart and go, first stop, look at the volume, see what happened on those days, and was it a sign of the smart money possibly doing something and you can start to read this basically like sort of CSI. I mean, this, I can study these charts for, for hours at a time looking to see what may or may not have happened. I'm just going to give you a couple of insights into possibly how to trade a position. It won't take too long, but we talked about this $10,000 of equity. Let's just say you've got 10,000 bucks. Have a thousand bucks. Doesn't make any difference. As I said, I'm getting ready to, uh, to this has put me on notice. I, am, I don't have a position. I'm getting ready to enter this trade. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to, because you can easily be wrong, I'm going to put in a sell order below the close of point C, which in this case is 43 and a half bucks. So if this stock carries on rolling up, I won't get executed. I'm going to put my stop loss, never trade without a stop loss. I would say you can run up the main street naked. You can, but you probably won't get very far. If you put on a trade without a stop loss, chances are, you're gonna, you're, gonna come on, you're gonna come unstuck. So always have a stop loss. And for me, the top of bar C, I can't see this going any higher. So if I enter at 43 and a half, I'm really cool with a $45 stop loss. A stop loss means I cannot lose more than 45 in basically a normal trading environment, unless it suddenly gaps up for some reason. So we talked about 1%. 1% is $100. I can't lose more than $100 because what, that's 1% of my 10,000 bucks. If I only use $100 and I know I've got a one and a half dollar stop loss here, I can only sell 66 shares. So if I sell 66 shares and I'm wrong, I'm down 100 bucks. That's okay. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my target. My initial target is 40. Why? Because of point B. And this was your first level of, of, uh, of support here. So I'm going to enter at 43 and a half and I'm going to set my first my first target at 40. If this starts to take a downtrend, you know what, I may take my target off. And what happens is I trail my stop down. Because guess what? Once this trades here, I, I enter here. What I do is I take my stop at 45, I lower it. So basically what we're doing is hit, I'm gonna lower my stop. So I'm gonna lower my stop to 45, to 43, to 42 and a bit. And I'm just gonna keep putting my stop 
every day when the market closes, I look and I say, okay, let's lower my stop. I don't know where this is going to go. It could keep falling. It could bounce back. I want to capture my break even pretty quickly. So I've entered at 43 and a half. And what I want to do is I want to basically lock in my break even. So putting my stop to here immediately means in theory, I can't lose money. I basically guaranteed myself the break even. If it carries on falling, I'm going to trail. And as soon as it starts going, you could cancel your target and just allow your stop loss to determine when you come out of the trade. You don't know when it's, you'll never pick the bottom. Don't, don't be a genius. But what you can do is by lowering your stop loss all the way down, guess what? You get the here, 36. Here we are. And when the stop, you see this volume, it's probably going to bounce. Bang, you're done. Now, what have we done on that trade? We basically had a one and a half dollar uh, risk, which was the 43 and a half entry, the 45 stop. And I set my target at 40 originally. And then in fact, so that was actually three and a half bucks. So entering at 43 and a half, taking the trade up at 40. But if you canceled that and you were smart enough or had enough foresight to go, you know what, I just let my stop do the work. You get out at 36, you lower your stop, stop all the way down. You basically have locked in seven and a half points. Seven and a half points over one and a half is a five times risk reward ratio. So you can bank 500 bucks. Now your equity is ten and a half thousand dollars. You've done one trade. All you've done is just, you haven't done anything. There's none of this noise and getting involved in it. The TV determined, oh my God, they're telling me that they, uh, you know, just trade on what you see. You don't need to hear anything. This is telling me everything I need to know. And you know something? The only couple of things I would watch for is if this was say Apple or JP Morgan, I just want to know when are their results day. And if it was here, that's the only thing I care about. Other than that, there's going to be no surprises. So I'm just going to allow, allow this trade to do, what it, to do what it does. There are kind of two styles of trading. You either have fundamental uh, investment where you're looking at a company. What's, what does it do for a living? What's its market share? What's its earnings per share? How does that compare to other tech or banking, et cetera, companies? Or you can be a technical trader. And a technical trader, which is what I do, allows you to basically study loads of things really quickly. And I don't really need to know the ins and outs of, uh, of JP Morgan or Apple or IBM. I'm interested to see, is the smart money leaving the building? Has this thing gone up and failed? Should I be getting involved in putting on a trade? And ultimately, what do I try to do as a trader? I try to maximize the probability of me being right. I am often wrong. But you know what? With a five, five to one risk reward ratio, I can be wrong four times in this trade and get it right once. And I still come out on top. And this is great risk management because all I've done is I've only ever put a hundred bucks at risk. The amateur probably won't even do this. They won't probably know what a stop sell is. They'll go and they'll buy here because they see the good news. They see the volume and they think, oh my God, big volume, big news, great results, I'm buying. And we need amateurs to do that. But actually what you should be doing is trying to help the amateurs to say, look, just be careful. Be careful. This is good news. Look at the volume. What does that tell you? Does it tell you that all the retail guys are suddenly selling? Of course they're not. It's good news. It means the smart money is probably leaving the building. Why? Because they need good news to sell those massive positions. They need 100,000 buyers to be able to go, thank you very much. And they'll take the view that once they've left, this thing may well tail off. It may carry on going, but you know what? More times than right, more times often they're right. That's why they call the smart money. Let's take another look. So basically what's happened is the stock has done this thing here. Let's just book point F. I'm looking for it to come back and test again. It's down here. Smart money is gone. This is to me looking like a nice little buy trade. And again, I won't run through these trades, but again, always put your buy order above the high. So if you're wrong, you don't get executed. It bounces up to guess where F look. And it's, if it comes back down again, this is called a double test. Think of, to me, this imagery as of a guy holding on with his fingernails on like a window ledge going, I'm not going to go down. And this is just awesome because to me, the bears have tried to shove it down to a new low. Remember here? New high. Failed. They tried to bang it down to a new low. And this to me is, this is such a great trade here. In fact, I highlight that as a trade. This to me is like, okay, this is candy from a baby stuff because this closed on its high. If I put a buy order in above the high of this bar, uh, I reckon if I get taken out, it's probably going to pop. And it may just pop up a couple of bucks. 
but it doesn't matter. It's just a, again, it's just a really, really low risk, nice trade. You don't have to be clever. Take what's on offer and, uh, and basically don't be too greedy. And, uh, and then what happens is I get stopped. Either my trade executes here and guess what? It carries on rallying up. Look where it gets to. Look at point B. Remember that? The ice line. Is it going to break the ice? It kind of bumps its head and fails. Comes back down again to here, point F. And you just, now you've, you've got a recalibration now. Here, it was bobbling around here. This is the new range here now. And it's trading now between what we call the creek and the ice. And this is great territory because it's probably going to bomb around. And look at this. It's now getting set up, in my view, to, to rally. And this is this move here, relatively low volume. Look how easily it flies. So if, you, if I was a betting man, this stock's probably going to go back up to the, uh, to the mid 40s. And there's a few more trades to be had there. So um, I always say not trading is a really, really good strategy. And amateurs tend to think that if they don't do a trade in four days, they're really, really doing something wrong. Actually, I've been watching this here. Look at this. I've been sat here watching for the whole of July and August, waiting for this trade. The best traders are just patient. They don't do anything. They're just watching. They're waiting. They know, they know the trigger that they're looking for. And they'll go in one trade. And look what happens. What was it? 7%. No trading here. So you've got basically to cause this volume bar caused this effect. It took a few days, but guess what? This was the trigger. This cause here, this bar here, caused this rally here. The smart money's gone back in. So you've got supply and demand going on here. So the smart money is supplying here. They're demanding here. They're probably demanding here because they think it's going to basically go back up again. And this is the effort versus reward. It's what we talked about with those, with those laws at the beginning. So if we just take a, a quick summary, we try to try to, again, just, it's just a little lesson into risk management, knowing how to, knowing how to minimize your losses, understanding how to run your profits, run them. If you believe in your system and it's working, don't take your money off. Just let your stop loss do the work for you. Just trail it down or trail it up. So those simple trades I showed you, it's just a, it's a hypothetical example of what you might have been able to do if you knew what to look for. Of course, you're not going to capture every trade. Of course, you're always, and you know, the, the, the weakest point of any trade is you. The trader is the weakest point. Psychologically, you're going to be thrown everything at your head to say you're doing this wrong. The, res the results have come out. They're amazing. What are you doing shorting the company on a test? What are you thinking? And of course, when it starts to roll over, you know what you're looking for because you can see what the smart money has done. So always try to minimize the risk you have. I use 1%. Sometimes I use half a percent if I'm trading Forex. Um, don't, don't go too high. Think about it. If you start with $10,000 and you lose 20%, you're at $8,000. You need to make 25% to get back to 10,000 bucks. I know that's obvious, but I tell you what, it's incredibly hard to make 25%. The best hedge funds in the world don't make 25%. And so if you're an amateur trader and you think I can take my 20 grand and turn it into 50, you're just like, dude, please stop. You'll be the best hedge fund in the world if you can do that. And I can promise you, you won't be able to do it because you probably don't have the discipline in place. Because actually what you need to do is to remove all emotion from trading and just look at it as a study. And that's where you start to uh, um, learn how to be disciplined and start to, as, as you as the trader, start to become increasingly in control of your destiny. So if you look at this, we only ever risk 1% in every trade. And obviously what happens is when we start off with 100 bucks, by the time we get to 11,000, it's 110 bucks. You're, you're gradually compounding the growth over time. The average trade was only three to seven days. It took me 30 days to go in because I was studying and I was watching and every day I just look at this thing and go, okay, not yet, not yet, not yet. Here we go. Always use a stop limit to buy or sell, put it above the high or the low of that bar we were talking about earlier. Um, always, always have a stop loss. You need a stop loss to, to follow this rule here. Always have a stop loss. And if you can trail it, trail it down. And by the way, if you want your stop loss to be really high, it just means your, your position needs to be smaller. So instead of 66 shares, maybe you only do 20 shares. It doesn't matter. Do what you feel comfortable with, but don't ever have more than a hundred bucks at risk if you've got a ten thousand dollar account. That would be my advice. You shouldn't be in a position where you're down at six thousand dollars when you start with ten. If you're down at six thousand dollars, go back to your day job because you shouldn't be a trader because you're a schmuck. It doesn't matter how how you justify it. 
you know, you just amazing excuses that people give me over time. I mean, I, I looked after 300 traders globally and I've heard every excuse. When I was growing, when I was coming to training, I used those excuses as well. You know, it's just a load of rubbish. Um, you just have to be absolutely objective and just cut out the shit and basically understand that trading is really the purest of economies because it's basically you and your P&L. And if you're losing money, you're doing probably something wrong. If you're consistently losing money, you're definitely doing something wrong. But this takes time. You know, I often say with uh, friends of mine, first of all, why do you want to be a trader? You've got to, first of all, be able to um, make a living that A, covers the costs of your data feed and all that sort of stuff and allows you to draw equity. And for that, if you're going to make a living, you probably need 100,000 bucks. You need to make 40% a year. Those are the economies you're thinking of. If you've got $10,000, you think you're going to make some extra chump change, you, you might want to think twice about it if that's going to be your full-time job because you just won't be able to survive. So it takes one year to learn, one year to break even, one year to start making, one year to start drawing equity. It's a long, long cycle unless you can, you know, perhaps pick up some of these tricks a little bit earlier. All I'm trying to do is save you the time of, uh, of those losses and maybe fast track that. Increase the probability of success. Not trading as a strategy. You don't have to trade. Don't trade unless what you're seeing is telling you that the trade is setting up for an entry. You don't have to trade. Just watch. You'll be much smarter. Because chances are, if you're trading in the middle of one of those cycles, you might try and catch the trend, but you may also get caught the wrong way. So just be careful. And um, I don't trade. I don't uh, generally trade during the day. And that might sound funny. I do my homework after the market shut. So wait till the market's closed. Do your homework and I normally place my order before the open if I want to go in. I'm not one of these guys who uh, I trade less now because I'm busy doing other stuff. But I'm not one of these guys who tries to do 500 trades a day. I don't believe you can manage your risk like this if you've got 500 trades on. Again, that's just me. And that's not high frequency trading I'm talking about. I'm just talking about individuals with some capital um, deploying a trading strategy. And again, don't execute on news. What tends to happen is news will trigger the reaction and then you're getting ready if the volume explodes to get ready for that test. If you're waiting for that dip down to rally back up or dip up and rally back down again, then you're getting set up the bar cell. So, um, so I hope that helps. So should we have a look at BTC? Anyway, that's the, so that's kind of a guide to smart money trading. I hope that's been a- Yeah, it's uh, amazing. Little, that's perfect. Okay, cool. So look, here's one I prepared earlier. So I was looking at this this morning and um, uh, BTC is an interesting one because it's one of those, um, it's now starting to show signs of maturity. It's actually starting to look like, it, it, I hope I don't say the wrong thing, here, like a stock, meaning the <laughs> smart money, there has been adoption in Bitcoin. Um, you know, when we look back here, it was back in, you know, 2014, 15, 16, 17, it was really a clique. It was a small club of really smart people who saw the technology for what it was and got in early, but it was a retail game. Um, it's only really in the last couple of years that, institutions generally have really started to get involved and that allows us to to do some analysis so just for a couple of minutes where do we start let's just look at these volume bars here this is btc right so we can see straight away there were big volumes on certain days let's see if those are important and then let's look at where we are right now and it's a really interesting time where we are today and now this is a weekly chart and what I did was I thought it'd be actually quite cool to step out and a chart really to be meaningful, you probably need about 150, 200 lines. Don't look at 10 lines and think that's going to give you the full story. So a weekly chart is taking you all the way back to 2017 here. Okay. But this allows you to take back, sometimes it's really good to take a big time frame and look at a bit of a helicopter view to go, okay, this is interesting. Let's just go back to here. This was back in September 17. Massive volume. Let's have a quick look at the cross here. So I'm going to look at some of these numbers when I talk about the range. So let's just go on this bar here. Look at that. The high was 4.3, the low is 2.9. That's about 1,400, 1,500 bucks in a week. Now that's about 40, 50% from the 2.9. It doesn't look very big because back then BTC was lower. But this thing, was, this thing moved around 50% in a week. And my view is, obviously looking at what happened next, look at this volume. This was a smart money, probably for the first time going, we're going in. Now that could be any crypto fund or anybody that you might know. 
but this was probably where the smart money really to me first entered the game and this is a really interesting um a really interesting uh, period of time because we then saw leading up to we all remember december 18th this euphoric rise to 20,000. And it's obviously going completely crazy here. And then look what happens here. Big volume. This was probably the smart money going, okay, thank you. We're out. We bought at four. We'll sell at 20. We'll sell at 15. And again, would you remember the chart we looked at earlier? Let me just use an arrow here because it's a bit... You've got the high. It comes down to here, the low, and then it rallies again. So we're going to call this if you like, ice, ice line one. And then we'll see if that's important later on in time. Basically what happens is it rallies and then it basically, as I would say, breaks the ice and then it drops down to here, again, a big volume bar. So my view is distribution took place here. The euphoria, all those believers of BTC carried on pushing it. And of course, then they were thinking, oh my God, as it started to fall. The smart money comes back in. Look at this, five, nine. They're going back in again. They know exactly what they're doing. And you can tell what they're doing because this is the sign here. It's amazing how many traders never look at volume. So many people ignore volume. To me, it's the most valuable indicator you could ever wish for. I don't have, you know, look, let me just go on here. Here you go, look. Wow. These are all the things that you can use. Look at this, volatility stop. I've got a ruler and an arrow and some words, but it's telling me, I'm not saying I'm right. What I'm saying is you can learn a lot just by looking at the, one of the most fundamental basic charts that you could ever look at. I think there's accumulation going on here. And actually what you see then is, it then starts to get caught in this range for a little while. They've loaded up here and you'll see these highs start to come down. So it's starting to consolidate. And I believe starting to get ready over a year. They've continued to buy as it breached here. Look at this. We go back to this line here. It's breached here. And again, I think the smart money is going, we'll buy more. And they've waited. It's a long time. It's a lot of patience going on here. And it, if you remember, it trundled along at 4,000 post, uh, post the crash. And then bang, it started, uh, it started moving up. Now, again, what happens when it moves up? Basically what happened was, remember this ice line over here, it rallies all the way through, but again, look at the volume and look at this close here. It's identical to what we're looking at on the other chart. As it's used that horrible expression, it's closed on its ass. The volume disappears, the smart money's left. They basically bought a 5,000 and they've got out at 11. They doubled their money. It's a great, great strategy. Now, if you look at this in isolation of here, what, ha what actually happens, it comes back down again, reaches a bit of level of support, and then again, rallies here. This to me would be a great short if I was trading BTC. Now it's a weekly, it's a weekly bar, so just bear with, but it's closed again on its ass. This is showing systemic weakness, and it's probably likely, what we call this a mushroom, it's probably likely to roll over, and it does. It tests one more time, and then it's game over. And basically it staggers down again to this line over here. It bobbles around, and interestingly, again, look at this. This now becomes the resistance line. It's fading again, but look what happens when it comes down. Look at the volume, and this was COVID-19. This is when the shit started hitting the fan, if you remember when. COVID-19, oil collapsed. The world just went completely bonkers, and BTC basically fell from 11 down to three or something, right? Down to, down to here, 3,790. Look at what the smart money did. Here, 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 and actually here. They're buying. And when I was watching this at the time, in fact, I was asked by a, uh, uh, some interviewer, a journalist, what did I think was happening in BTC? And I said at the time, I see accumulation happening. I would expect to see a rally over the next few weeks because this was such a giveaway sign here. And this accumulation here, you're seeing now a rally. Now, this is why I said it's important. We talked about this ice line here. Look at this bar here. This, let's get the, uh, and then I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up. Okay, focus on these numbers here. Look at this ice line, let's go on there. Okay, the low, 9614. We know that this has been resistance here. It's been a line of resistance that BTC's been 
failed to break. Done it again here, failed. Look at where it is right now. The red dotted line is the current price, 9526. What did we say that line was? Look at the low, 9614. So this is a really, really awesome time. Now, when I see this, I've actually put question mark. I think smart money is selling because I think they bought here and I think they're taking some cash off the table at 9.6. I could be wrong and don't sell your position just because some guy in Gibraltar said he thought it was um, looking tired. But I would be interested to see that if this fails again, if we see a close, let's get the, uh, get the arrow. If we see this week, it close here, this potentially could be a great shorting opportunity again. And as I said, I'm not a professional advisor. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you, there are great indicators to look for, to try to understand and try to read what, what could the smart money be doing? And if you look at something like BTC, it's starting to show all the attributes of actually a maturing asset. So it's enabling someone like me to look at it and think, interesting, smart money. Smart money's going in, looks to me like distribution. Why? Huge range here, look at this. Where are we there? 10,300, a high of 14. That's a 40% move in one week and look where it closed. Horrendous. See if I can blow that up. Close there. They pushed it. They tried again, didn't make the high and look where it closed again. This is, I, I would always describe this as, a, as, a, as an asset in distress and it's probably 55, 45, likely to go lower before it goes higher. Not because it's BTC, just purely because of the price action that I'm seeing. I don't care what I hear. I'm looking at what I see. And this again, it tries again and look, fails. So you've always got to be mindful and careful. And there's going to be times when you put your trade on, you put your stop loss here, you lower it and you get stopped out and you may have even lost money or, or broken even. And you just think, damn, but that's just the cost of doing business. You don't always get it right. And this, this Bitcoin is, is super frothy, huge volatility all the time because there's so much passion about BTC. You have a huge amount of people who are emotional believers. And that's great for a stock. It's great for, for a professional trader because you, you love that emotion. Because you, as I said in that first slide, you want to exploit that emotion. The greed of BTC, you want to be able to leverage that to short. And, uh, and when there's fear, you want to be there to basically buy. And that's beautiful when you've got fear, like we had in COVID-19. And this smart money here is just saying, thank you very much. Come to daddy. Because they're just going to put this position on. And as soon as it rallies... And it may go through to here. If it reaches this again, again, I would be looking for weakness to basically look at potentially putting a short on. So, so, um, so that, and I hope that, uh, I hope that helped, but that's just a few insights from somebody with a, with a few years under his belt that may just as a, as an amateur trader, give you a bit of color on, and it's amazing how many traders I speak to, um, who, who didn't understand what 1% of their risk meant, didn't understand what protecting their equity means. And uh, they've worked so hard to earn it, and yet they seem really happy to lose it. And you've got to, you've got to try to, to help people to, um, to, to be more um, precious with their, with their cash. So, Nick, um, that was amazing. Uh, we learned so much. I know everyone who's watching is going to go back and rewatch that. We've got a couple more questions before we let you go on your merry way. Um, sorry, I took, sorry I took so long, guys, as well. No, that well worth the time. Perfect. Absolutely. What we're really high on here in crypto when we evaluate what to invest in and what to trade are fundamentals, the tokenomics, uh, the team, like all that other stuff. Do the fundamentals really matter in the markets? So many times during that presentation, you said it doesn't even matter what you're trading. It's just the price action and the volume. I think it depends what style of trading you're doing. I think if you are, because I think if you have a, a protocol or a, um, as you say, the tokenomics are good, the management team are amazing, the underlying technology is awesome, etc. I think that can support your argument. Um, but what I try to do is I try to say, don't let that cloud your judgment. You can still be passionate about a company and you can still think fundamentally that NEO or EOS or Ether or whatever is a really awesome piece of tech that's going to change the world. But what you want to be able to do is to bank that emotion, but then say, okay, but I also want to be able to use my money really wisely. So now I've learned a little bit about how to read charts. If something comes out with great news, so 
there is a version X of Ethereum and they're ready to roll it out and it's great news and ETH pops, but the volume explodes, I would be thinking, okay, I, lo I love it, but it's probably the smart money is probably now possibly selling. This thing may roll over and come down. I would rather buy low and sell high than just be stubborn emotionally invested because actually you can be emotionally invested in something, but then turn that into being a much more astute trader. Because I think a lot of people at 18,000 thought that BTC was going to 100,000, right? And people still talk about it. I read on Cointelegraph last week, somebody was saying go to 400,000. I'm thinking I can move to Hollywood and become an actor, right? I, I, I don't know if that's gonna happen. What I can do is I can tell you, hopefully what the smart money is doing. And if you see good news and the thing pops and there's no volume, it tells you also the smart money isn't selling. So they know something's happening. So again, just try to think of it that if you were sat there with a, and bear in mind, this is a pretty small market, right? It's a quarter of a billion, 250 billion in crypto assets. It's like a quarter of Amazon, right? For the whole universe. So it's a pretty small market. So if you've got 500 million in your crypto fund, you can move markets and you can do a lot of damage. But if you're going to establish a position, you can only buy on things like COVID-19. And if you need to sell that position, you can only sell when there is utter euphoria. So I think what you have to do is, I, I'm never ever going to criticize fundamental trading because it's, it's, as I said at the beginning, you've got two styles. What you can do is you can think, these guys have an, honestly an amazing piece of technology. And you know, Tezos, they're just smart guys, great foundation, they're changing the world, they're amazing, but you know what? I can see that this token is possibly gonna be due for a rollover because of what the chart is telling me. Or I can actually see that this token is actually due now to rise because the smart money has been accumulating. Not only do I love this company, I now I'm gonna buy it because I'm a smart trader. I hope that helps. That's super fascinating. Uh, really love everything that you're talking about. The one thing that, we, that I kinda wanna ask before we let you go is uh, you, you look at volume, do you ever look at momentum and, and try and spot divergences between momentum and price action and volume? Do you know what? It's funny because I used to. So when I first, um, I, I saved the boring story, but when I first left investment banking and um, look, I had two and a half thousand employees. So I was really full of my own self-importance and I thought I was just amazing. And when I was suddenly at home in my study with my two screens and my wife saying, you come into the shops to get to, to help me with load the car up, you realize that actually you're, uh, you're not as important as you once thought you were. I was an, a momentum trader. And that's how I first started. And what I, and basically I started losing money. And I started thinking, hang on a second, this, go back to first principles. What a lot of momentum indicators do, and you know, there'll be momentum guys who will argue with me. A lot of momentum indicators use increased volume. Increasing volume tends to make the, the acquisition more attractive because momentum is often about A, the trend, but B, the volume. And actually what, what I've, learned is actually volume can be a great indicator in getting ready to do the opposite of what, what a momentum indicator might be telling you to do because there are some momentum in indicators which which will be the high minus the low times by the volume and that'll give you a force index and you'll go wow so if the high minus the low times by volume is x that's a buy where i'm thinking it's not it's me getting ready to short right because the smart money is basically bailing and this volatility is showing me the height of the battle is raging. And as soon as the volume disappears and the bars start to shrink, it's like, well, here we go. Now we're getting ready for that test for me to either buy or for me to short or for me to, to, uh, to do something. So I'm always, um, there's nothing, you can be a great momentum trader, by the way. Again, you just, it's whatever style works for you. But I found for me, after consistently losing for about six months, I just thought, <laughs> okay, I've either got to go and do something else or I've got, to, I've got to go back to first principles and figure out what was I doing at that investment bank and why was I you know, potentially doing things which were working pretty well? How can I read what I used to do just by looking at the chart? Fascinating. That is such an insider look uh, that I don't think anybody anywhere in the world would have been able to get unless they were here at the Crypto Hedge Fund Summit, man. So thank you very, very much for joining us. Pleasure, guys. Thanks, um, for, host thanks for hosting me. It's been a real, real treat. Thanks this for indulging crazy. me. Yeah, thanks. no, we, we, we love it. We hope to have you back on the podcast here sometime soon. Great stuff. Take care, guys. Take care. Thank you.